make it very straightforward the differences between models, performance, architecture, etc., as it relates to actual real world performance. And why I say that and why I think that this video is important to make is that there's an extreme difference between actual real world performance, like what would matter in a business and corporate setting, which is really kind of what I'm trying to get at with this particular video, as opposed to in a research setting and for a like pure researcher. What a pure researcher is looking for and what they get often excited about about AI is the exact opposite of what actually matters and practically matters when it comes to a corporate involvement with an AI. And I think that to me, that particular subject and that like disconnect is a large part of the disconnect as to why a lot of like corporations aren't understanding kind of yet what the feasibility, actual like feasibility is of AI and, and like how to operate within this framework and what to do within it. So my goal is to essentially like break that down for you. And I think that the best way to break that down is to explain kind of like what the differences are in these different terms that you hear in regards towards different ways to train and models, right? Because at the end of the day, what this all boils down to is just training these models. <clears throat> and then so the very first question that we are faced with within this is, do we train our own model or do we go with one of these models that already exist, right? And then so just to give you a, an idea, like so um, Facebook's latest model, Llama 3, is right about to come out as of the making of this video. It's already out in the 70B version and the 7B version, but like not the full, like they're going to release like a 400B version. That 400B version costs them $100 million to, to train from the ground up. That's the training cost. Like that's just the, the like giving it the data and training it. A, a lot of people think like, well, that, that, that's the cost to build the model, right? Like, no, like, the, like to, to build this model without any sort of data attached to it is fairly straightforward. I've got I have a ton of videos where I go over and into like how exactly to build an LLM model from the ground up. It's essentially you just, it's parameters, number of parameters and number of layers, right? So it's, parameters and layers and and and, really, and that's your general architecture there's like transformers that go within that and and different types of architectures when you get into like neural networks um and and scaling up right but it's the thing like it's free to to build like a multi-billion parameter model it costs a uh, hundred million dollars to properly train a 400 million dollar uh, 400 million parameter billion parameter model and that's what's um, important in, in this distinction to me, right? And then so a lot of people like that, that first thing is like, well, do we want to like, we should train it from scratch. And then it's like, well, from a cost perspective, uh, if you really want to get into training your model from scratch and have it actually perform, like with these top models, it's a hundred million dollar investment. Do you, do you, do you who wants, I mean, uh, unless you're like, okay, AI or Mixtral or Amazon, like I don't really think a lot of companies are lining up for that $100 million investment, right? Um, and then so that's just the, the first thing to, to come up with from, and, that, and that's just the, the cost, right? And then so the second thing you could say is like, well, like, you know, we could train a, a smaller parameter model. And then so I think that there's been kind of a disservice, I would say, with regards towards, uh, and I'm a part of it, like with regards to the, the um, optimism a year ago or so, starting about a year ago, with regards towards how exactly, how much, how many gains could be made by shrinking parameters of models, right? So at this time, uh, Llama just dropped, right? Like Llama dropped in March of last year. Um, so like at this time last year, like we're like a month into Llama, Llama one, right? Like Vicuna has just dropped. Uh, and then so uh, this, this is just all the buzz time, right? And then we're, just starting to see like Vicuna is much more powerful than Llama, um, but it's also like more parameters. And then so we're starting to play around with that equation, right? And then starting to see like, okay, like uh, what can we do without scaling up parameters? And then that's kind of been like a lot of focus, right? But what we're seeing, and then so this chart here is like all of the, the um, open source and closed source models that are have been released 
like period, like uh, since uh, like uh, 2012. And what we can see looking at the kind of the graph that matters here for the most part is this has the last like two years. Uh, all of these models, like all of the green models are all of the open source models. Uh, and then we see Cloud3, Opus, uh, Gemini, uh, and then GPT-4 right there at the very top, right? And then these greens are nowhere near those models. And Llama 3 is going to be the one that's going to bring it to those models, right? But uh, there's a thing to point out with these models is that they're they're capping at the, all of these models are capping at 132 billion parameters is the biggest one, which is that Databricks constr uh, uh, instruct model, this model here, right? And even that's getting like outperformed by, I think, com uh, Cohere's command R plus is 70 billion. So like the top performing models in the open AI, in the open source framework are in this 70 billion parameter architecture currently. Uh, whereas these models here are from what we know, like 400 billion to 1 trillion parameters, uh, or even 1.5 trillion parameters. Um, so huge difference, it's up to 10, 15 times bigger than these models. And then so when Llama comes out, Llama 3 comes out, it will be the first one to like close this gap, right? And then so Llama 3 will bring the green bar up here. Uh, but the big thing with that, right, is it costs $100 million to train the model and the big improvement for Llama 3 is that it's going to be a 400 billion parameter model, which is like the biggest one that's been released. Again, it's all, like we're operating in 70 billion parameter range for uh, uh, open the top performing open source models now. And then I think this is a more, they have a few more telling charts here. Uh, here's this, this perfect one, right? So uh, this is just very clearly outlines it, uh, that the scaling of uh, performance is directly related to scalar parameters like it's it just a flat out correlation if you want your model to perform better you give it more parameters llama 2 7b performs better like worse than llama 13b which performs worse than 30 33b which performs worse than 34b which performs worse than 65b which performs worse than 70b and it's just very linear that way right and then that goes up and up and up as far as we know right there's like we haven't hit the cap of going up yet and then so that's where everybody's focused right that's where like all these big dogs are like again it's 100 million dollars to enter that game right just to enter into it um same thing here and this is the like with all of the models right and then so this is a good overlay because this is even like like it's not just the llama family right uh it's multiple models and then what you can see is it's just very clearly number of parameters is scaling up the performance of all open source model of all AI models period that's the trend right more parameters more more performance better performance it's not like a 7b model all of a sudden is clocking in and, and beating out these 70b parameter models which is what we kind of thought would and could possibly happen a year ago so that's not the case so that kind of like again like that rhetoric from and, and kind of like over acceptance on that time needs to go um it's bad at this point because it's not working out and it's not what we're training towards what we're training towards within this is like bigger performing models are better performing models and then so the next step within that and then the next uh, kind of like thing that 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 people start thinking about then right is like well then i don't want like a gpt wrapper um and then i think like that's the like people get this misconception as to what exactly a GPT wrapper is at this point um, and then what exactly like a a um, like a, a, a fine t the difference between a fine-tuned model and bringing up your model from scratch right so even if we're talking about like a, a, a 7 billion parameter model um, you're still talking about like a, a like a multi-million dollar investment to train up a model that you know is going to n never benchmark anywhere near GPT-4 or any of these top ones just because of the number of parameters, right? And there's nothing that you can do about that. It will never score better than them. And then, so your entire millions of dollars investment into that, what are you doing it for then besides research purposes, right? Like, that's what it all, like, that's, I mean, at the end of the day, there's only a few players that are building models in this size and in this playground, and there's going to be only a few. I think that the more players that exist in this playground, the better, right? Like, the, like I don't knock any of these guys. Like, like 
I'm rooting for all of these guys, right? Because at this point, like, I want multipolarity. Like, I don't want one of them all of a sudden to, to just exist, like, to swallow up all of the other ones. So this type of thing where it's multiple players, if, if it's you have the money to invest then and you want to, then you can, and you want to invest $100 million, then you can build the biggest model that you want. And you, you can do that if you want, right? Um, I think that's good. And that's how it should be overall. And that's kind of how it, it maintains, right? But there's not a very particular reason for you to be one of these players. Like, uh, I, I don't think that being one of these players is a profitable business model, personally. Like, there's no, like these players are, are not making money off of this. And like the companies that are succeeding, like uh, they're the ones <laughs> that are making the most money in other areas, right? And I think that argument could be made as to that's why Google's not succeeding because Google's also being hurt by this with regards towards the AI space. Like they have like perplexity, perplexity AI, right? Which came out of nowhere. It's kind of like beating Google's head in right now in like search space, right? And there's a lot of complications that are going on with regards towards like AI infiltrating the Google search and then how exactly Google wants to and is reacting around all of that. And then so it's creating like a problems for Google overall, right? In regards towards its other market segments. And because it's creating problems in its other market segments, Google can't perform as nimbly in this area. Whereas Meta, big Meta, right? Is like, it, like it, it rides on the Instagram cash cow and the WhatsApp cash cow and like that's what it does, right? It just milks those and it's good to go. Um, and it, it like the boomers on Facebook and it can it can just go and go and dump its money into AI and that's what it does, right? And then that works out for it, but it's not going into Amazon and Microsoft is the hugest one, right? They're just buying up all the players within this to buy them up because they realize that it's a money investment now for payoff later. Um, and that's the thing, right? Like it's all of these big players that are realizing and having these additional avenues to not dump in. They're not going in and, and being like, uh, we're like AI startup and, and like all we do, is you have a few, like you have Falcon and you have uh, uh, Mistral. Uh, and then like, uh, but like, so you have two players within that, right? But like, they're still, they're bleeding money, right? Like they're all bleeding money. Databricks has support from other areas. Like Databricks is, big in the like the data storage space and things like that they have a reason to get into this ancillarily uh and then i think that's like a lot of these players that are <clears throat> building in those these their models or their own models or fine-tuning their models they have a reason to get into this into building their own model if you don't have any reason to get into building your own model then there's then you should be looking at these models right and then the, like kind of the first thing that people say is like well i don't want a gpt wrapper and then so what exactly is a GPT wrapper, right? Because fine tuning a GPT model is not a GPT wrapper, uh, right? So let's start off and we'll go through kind of like the the scale of like tuning a model essentially. And then so we can do this by looking at directly a GPT-4 model. And then so the very first thing that I'll show you is rag tuning a model, right? Rag tuning is kind of is the most basic thing that you can do to this model and it's not even tuning it on any level so this would be a step below a gpt wrapper right uh, and then rag tuning is very straightforward so you have this attachment button here with gpt4 which makes it very simple i'll go to downloads i'm just going to find a pdf all i want is a pdf uh, i don't even know what is in this pdf but i'm going to upload it <laughs> uh, and then can you tell me what is in this pdf uh, can you give me a summary of this PDF file? I have no idea what it is. So hopefully it's something good or like not, you know, bad. Uh, let's see. Okay, cool. A uh, PDF introduces an efficient <laughs> to scale transformer based LLMs to handle infinitely long inputs while using bounded in memory and uh, computation. This is achieved through a new memory attention mechanism called infinite attention, which incorporates a compressive memory into the standard attention framework. The method and method combines both mass local attention. Oh yeah, I think that's something I made. Um, so yeah, like I think like uh, this is uh, like, <laughs> uh, I know what this is now, <clears throat> but so, uh, this is like uh, overall, like so. Essentially, what it, all I'm doing right is I'm just feeding the model uh, the PDF in this instance, and then so I'll pull it up here. Uh, actually, I think this might be the research paper. Uh, let's see. Ah, oh, yeah, yeah. 
for uh for Lara, this is it for Larimer episodic memory, uh, and then so it's just giving us this essentially like the the um, background and the summary of this research paper, right? And then so this research paper is another good nine ten. 17, I believe. Okay, 17 pages. Uh, and then so uh, it's it gives us a 17 page summary into like a paragraph, right? Like pretty cool. So then we can ask it like all different types of questions about this PDF document, right? And I can like every, like, uh, so uh, ChatGPT4 has a, I think it's a token range of, a quoted token range of like 200,000 tokens. But generally speaking, from research, you don't want to go above like 82,000 tokens, I think is what they say. Um, and then so. Uh, within that range, it's going to be quite good, and it'll, it'll be able to memorize and, and go through everything that it needs to. Uh, but then, so you might want to like refresh its memory every so often, uh, and then like clear the conversation, and then like fully refresh it, and then get your new tokens and ask it like new questions about it, right? But so this is Ragtoon, where it's just essentially giving it a document and then having it like source directly from that document, like use that document to like increase its answers in a way, right? Uh, is the best way to put it. Um, and then so this is again a step below GPT wrappers and then so like let's go up from here and then like so then what is an actual GPT wrapper like when people say GPT wrappers like what is the concept that they're like they're talking about and then so generally speaking what they're they're referring to uh, in this instance is like the, the very simplest version of a GPT wrapper uh, is essentially like a, a GPT um, which is essentially like a, a, a like from if you go on to like the open AI store GPTs uh, you, you've got like different models that you can pick from here uh, and then it's essentially like a, a step above rag tuning a, a model it's kind of like perma rag tuning a model I guess would be the simplest way to put it but then you can also add uh, function capabilities uh, and and create actions uh, within it are kind of like the two big selling points they've started to make with GPTs uh, and then actions are like a, like like what Copilot does, right? Where it can search the internet. Uh, you see here web browsing. It can make documents. Code interpreter. You can turn off or on, and it's default off because if you turn it on, there's a whole bunch of security risks and and a whole bunch of things that you open yourself up to uh, by turning that on. <laughs> but uh, so they turned off by default, and they'll tell you that. But they just have it off by default, right? Uh, but that's why is because it's like huge security vulnerabilities to to turn that on. Uh, and then it will oftentimes turn it on by default. If like you, if your documents have code and it needs to interpret the code, it's going to turn on code interpreter by default. Um, but then, so creating actions is like calling an API, like different thing, you know, like uh, different actions, external actions, external from GPT that GPT can take, right? So it can it can formulate um, actions based off of that. And then, so you can then uh, what you can't do within this is so like you you can't um, directly like uh, put a front end interface like on top of and ha and directly call like the the GPT's service right they don't want you to do that but you can gate GPT's uh, whereas like sign up for my GPT's via like my website etc like kind of like I guess it would be like the equivalent of like um, having a product on like Etsy um, or like an eBay um, and then on your own website right and selling on your own website as opposed to like the OpenAI website in this instance which is kind of like what that equivalent would be. Um, and then, but so this is the like most basic way that you can get a GPT out there, right? Like any sort of GPT model. Um, and then, so when people say GPT wrappers, what they're very specifically talking about is we go to OpenAI here to their website. We log in in this instance. And then we go to API. Uh, and then so in this instance, it's very straightforward. Uh, and then so once we're here, we see over on the left hand side, we've got uh, different options. So uh, we're currently right now in our default project. And then we've got playground, assistance and fine tuning. Uh, we're going to pay attention to fine tuning in this particular instance. Uh, and then so what we can see here is like, uh, in this instance, I've got a uh, fine tuned model here. Uh, and then I can go through with it and play it in the playground. But so 
this model is essentially fine-tuned on a data set. Very simple. You just hit create here, upload your data set, make sure that it, it has its structured properly uh, within your data set, and then you configure your kind of parameters for the training. Very straightforward to do uh, as far as like training a, a, a GPT on this level, and this is GPT 3.5, right? And then so when people say, when people talk about GPT wrappers, this is what they're talking about, is like fine-tuning a GPT 3.5 model. Um, and then they say like, well, I, I don't want to release a GPT wrapper. Uh, and then I think that uh, a year ago or so, there was a lot more like hype around that, right? And again, going back to like these conversations that kind of need to like, be undone as to what we thought and how we thought this was going to play out as opposed to how this is actually playing out. But so how this is actually playing out is again, going back to this chart, which all that matters is that bigger is better. At the end of the day, nothing beats bigger, right? Let's go up to the main one here. This one here. Uh, and then I'll zoom it in. Perfect. Uh, and then so just looking at this, <clears throat> there's nothing that we can do to uh, fix this equation, right? If we train our own model, if it's not a 70 billion parameter model, then it's going to perform less than these guys. If it's not an 11 billion parameter model, it's going to perform less than flaw, right? Like, that's just how it is uh, with regards towards the, the performance, maybe not flaw, but... Uh, with with the with how these models um, operate, right? Um, and nothing changes this equation. So uh, when we're talking about GPT wrappers, what we can see is that up until like up until Quad Three Opus, literally, GPT wrapper was the best that you could do. Uh, and then some people say, well, I don't want a GPT wrapper, but it's at the end of the day, like every model loses to GPT wrapper is like kind of what that breakdown is, right? If you're talking about pure performance, like I, all I care about is the most performant model, then either GPT wrapper or Claude 3 wrapper are going to smoke anything else. And it doesn't matter what uh, data set you, you pick and what model you pick, right? Let's say, or and what industry you pick. Let's say I want to pick like, uh, I want to make a lawyer, an AI lawyer, right? Perfect example. Uh, and then I'm going to feed it, like, I have, like, all the data sets. I'll feed it, like, all the law data sets. And I, I can feed all these models the same um, data set. I can already tell you, if we do that, the same data sets across the board, the same training across the board, I can already tell you how these models are going to shake out as far as performance in the end, right? Which is going to be Cloud 3 Opus will be number one. GPT-4 will be number two. And then Gemini Ultra will be number three. And then everything else will be quite low below that. And that's just exactly how it is. And then so there's a very specific reason, like if you notice that, like if you're aware, there's a big, the biggest uh, currently like model being trained in this space, like this AI lawyer space is uh, called Harvey, Harvey AI. And it's a GPT wrapper. It's GPT-4 being trained specifically on GPT-4 because they went through this equation, right? They went through and they trained these lower models and they trained their own model. That was their initial goal. And then they, so they trained it up uh, and then it's, and this is a story that is starting to become as old as time. They train it up and then they get smacked around by GPT-4. Another company that experiences this is Bloomberg, right? So Bloomberg, with all of their uh, financial data, they said, we're going to train our own model that's going to smack around GPT-4 and we're going to call it like, FinGPT, right? And then so they train like their own like 7 billion parameter model. It's been like millions of dollars, I think like, like, uh, like 10, 15 million dollars training their model uh, and then it gets obliterated by, like, just straight up, like, obliterated by GPT-4. Like, n like not even close. Uh, and then that's what everybody finds, right? And then they didn't do it again. Because it's like, like, why, right? Um, but, like, unless you have, like, very, very specific reasons to keep that data ultra proprietary, you're looking at, like, GPT, like, quote-unquote GPT-4 wrapper, outperforming anything else and then but the what is wrong with that is the equation that I would turn it back on to people then and <clears throat> the other thing that I think that people don't look at then is do you need the most performant model right like so in a world where GPT wrappers are the most performant model 
what's a minstrel rapper compared to a GPT-4 rapper. And then at the end of the day, it's about 85% of the performance for 15% of the comps. <laughs> like, it, it's pretty significant, right? Uh, and then, like, that's kind of – and then you can play around with those numbers more and more. And then that's why you care about these models is because, okay, I can – like, I know what the benchmark is for 100% performance, but like, you don't always – want, need, and people aren't always willing to pay for 100% performant models, or they don't necessarily need 100% performant models. And most, in, in a lot of instances, a model that is 80% performant is going to handle most of the situations that you would want, especially from like a business perspective, once you understand and actually dive into what those specific and particular business perspective and situations are. And I think that's another part of the missing gap within this still as to uh, the AI equation for businesses is like what exactly can and can you not do with AI, but I'll save that for another and future video. Uh, so in that and in this, it wraps up essentially the kind of basic summary of the practical uh, AI differences between models and training and performance uh, for essentially corporate uses. So I hope you have found this video uh, enlightening. And if you like this type of content, please like and subscribe. Thank you very much.